So my brief is to talk about uh, from corticosteroids to monoclonal antibodies. So we're really getting into some of the more medical aspects of treatment that's not quite here yet, but every year we're getting closer and closer and it's getting more and more exciting. So we've heard a little about the fact that CRS is really an umbrella term. And within that term, we, we refer to different phenotypes and endotypes. So we have a range of forms of chronic rhinosinusitis that we think about, those without polyps, those with polyps, those that have allergic fungal sinusitis, those with asthma and those without asthma. And the interesting thing is that um, these may share similar pathomechanisms and I'm talking mainly today about T2 inflammation, and that, that can apply to patients with fungal sinusitis or CRS with nasal polyposis. And yet again, there may be different pathomechanisms within the one subgroup. So there are patients with CRS and nasal polyposis who are not predominantly driven by a T2 inflammation. We know that asthma comorbidity is low in the non-T2 endotype but it's up to 70% in the T2 high endotype. And I would say that the coexistence of asthma with CRS is a really good marker for your T2 inflammatory response and ultimately down the track for success with some of the monoclonals I'm going to talk about. So this is a really neat little graphic way of, of describing that. So we can see that the majority of patients with CRS with nasal polyps do have T2 type inflammation, as do those with <coughs> asthma and AFRS. Um, Most patients with CRS without polyps do not have T2 inflammation, but there is an overlap. And we don't, we're not clever enough yet to tease these out completely, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is overlap. So there are a subgroup of patients with CRS, with nasal polyposis, who are uncontrolled despite the best of medical therapy and the best of sinus surgery. We know that polyp recurrence is common um, after 18 months in, in about 30 to 40 percent and in a European study three years post-surgery 45 percent of these patients still qualified as being uncontrolled. We know from Klaus Backett's work that there are some tissue biomarkers that predict recurrence and these include the IgE level, ECP as a measure of eosinophilic um, inflammation, and IL-5 for the same reason. So these are patients who have T2 inflammation. So the consequences of poor control is that these poor patients are exposed to repeated oral steroid use because it comes down to the fact that that's the only thing that seems to relieve them. So they usually have several bursts of oral steroids each year. We know that nearly half of them will de develop some osteopenia or even osteoporosis, and some of them will go on to develop a degree of adrenal insufficiency. We know that continuous use of steroids, even at a low dose of five milligram a day, over years will lead to higher rates of diabetes, osteoporosis, dyspeptic disorders, and cataracts and that's been shown in the asthma population as well. So even so-called low-dose steroids comes at a great cost to patients. And I don't really need to tell you about all the horrible side effects of steroids, but really there is not a body system that you can point to that isn't impacted adversely by use of corticosteroids. Many of these will occur with prolonged use and many of them are dose-dependent. So the dose-dependent side effects with oral steroids include the hyperglycemia, the hyperlipidemia, peptic ulcer disease, and psychosis, meaning that the higher the dose, the more likely you're going to see this, even if it's short-term use. And then you have the duration-dependent, and again, it may be low to moderate use, but eventually you're going to see a lot of osteoporosis, you're going to put your patient at risk of opportunistic infection, and obviously in children, you'll see growth retardation. Even short-term oral steroid use is associated with a plethora of side effects that most of us would want to avoid. There was a really interesting paper published two years ago that did a very complicated study looking at databases of patients who had received moderate to low dose steroids 
over time for a variety of medical conditions, including rheumatological, ENT and respiratory. And what they found was that within a month of oral steroid initiation, the incidence of acute uh, adverse effects, and they only looked at a few, that included sepsis and venous thromboembolism and fracture, increased by two to five fold above the background rate. And these increased risks were seen with doses under 20 milligrams. So clearly there is a treatment gap. We have patients who are discomforted by their CRS with nasal polyposis, who failed topical therapy applied correctly, they failed surgery, and they've had exposure to oral corticosteroids. So clearly, we need new treatments. So in the last few years, there's been a massive shift in our thinking with patients with asthma. And we've identified that about two thirds of our patients with severe asthma have T2 inflammation. And there are hallmarks that we can readily measure now in the clinic to um, see, see which patients have this T2 inflammation. And they have been the group that has been targeted with a new generation of very targeted monoclonal antibody therapies. Now, everyone in this room knows that there are similarities between asthma inflammation and CRS inflammation. There is a comorbidity relationship, and we know that a fair proportion of our patients who have severe asthma will have significant uh, inflammation in the sinuses as well. Most importantly, and perhaps the strongest link, is that the cytokine patterns in sinus tissue of CRS strongly resembles that that we see in the bronchial tissue in severe asthma. And that explains the presence of eosinophils in both the upper and the lower airway in both these conditions. So in other words, both of these conditions manifest as similar pro-inflammatory cytokines that drive the eosinophilic inflammation. So are biological the answer for our patients with sinusitis? There have been a number of studies now published looking at four monoclonal antibodies, and they're all the ones that have been used in asthma studies, and all of these drugs now have reached the market for severe asthma. We've heard several mentions today of omeluzumab, there's mepoluzumab and resliuzumab. Uh, the one that's missing from this slide is benraluzumab, but there are phase two studies in sinusitis with benra. And then there's dupilumab, which I'm going to speak a little more about. So there are current clinical trials that are focused on patients that have CRS with nasal polyposis because of the similarity of the inflammation with severe asthma. There is a whole lack of any investigation yet of the relative non-eosinophilic group, so we can't speak anything more about that group today. So the really big news and the things that's changed from last year to this year is the FDA approval for dupilumab specifically for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. And this is the first registration worldwide for a specific therapy for CRS. And I think that's really exciting. So physicians and ENT surgeons in the States now have access to that as long as you have um, good insurance. We yet don't have dupilumab registered in this country for CRS. We do have it registered for atopic dermatitis and asthma, and one would hope the company will go for registration for CRS. That doesn't mean reimbursement, it's registration. That's the first step. So, it was treated as a drug of importance by the FDA, and they don't give that status likely. And it's because it's been the first specific therapy that's been shown to be beneficial for patients inadequately controlled with other therapies. We know that dupilumab reduces nasal polyp size, it improves congestion, and it certainly improves all the measures of um, benefit for increasing smell and for quality of life um, measures. So the FDA approval depended on two pivotal trials that are known as the Sinus 24 and the Sinus <coughs> 52 studies. That just refers to the number of weeks that the, uh, the drug was given for. And these were part of their Liberty clinical trial program, which involved patients with asthma as well. So they've looked at two doses, 200 and 300 milligrams, 
It is a fortnightly injection, so all the monoclonals we have are given by injection. But dupilumab is something that patients can self-inject. It's a subcutaneous, comes in a pre-filled syringe. And we have some patients with asthma now who have been on an open arm of a study that do this um, quite happily every two weeks. While there are injection site reactions early on, these almost always wear off after a few injections. So they looked at co-primary endpoints, um, which was nasal construction, uh, nasal obstruction and congestion, and uh, also nasal polyp scores. And there were impressive reductions in both these things for both doses, with um, not a lot of benefit between the two doses. There were secondary endpoints, such as improvement on the CT scan and improvement in the loss of the sense of smell. So dupilumab is an incredibly clever development, an engineered molecule that targets both IL-4 and IL-13. Now the importance of that can't be underestimated. It's targeting the common part of the receptor for these two cytokines. Now early on there were a number of IL-4 monoclonal antibodies developed and we all thought they would be an answer, but they failed miserably. And the reason for that is that IL-4 has a lot of redundant <coughs> properties that are substituted for by IL-13. So if you don't block IL-4 and IL-13 simultaneously, you don't get a response. So with this one molecule, you can block the activity of both these pivotal cytokines that drive eosinophilic inflammation. And I think that's why it's, it's so successful across a number of eosinophilic and allergic conditions. We looked at this also in one of our studies, um, which was a multinational study, looking at the efficacy of dupilumab in uncontrolled moderate to severe asthma. And we did a post hoc analysis that took the patients with severe asthma who also had CRS, and we compared them to the severe asthmatics who didn't have CRS. Now, all the asthma improved, but interestingly, those who had concomitant CRS got the greatest improvement in both doses of dupilumab, the 200 and the 400. So the difference here was an improvement of um, in about 60% compared to 40%. So the conclusion here is that CRS is probably a good marker of those patients with asthma who are going to get an even better response from dupilumab than those with asthma without CRS. What about the other monoclonals? Well, omeluzumab was the first kid on the block. We've now had it available in this country for asthma for the last 15 years. It's an anti-IgE molecule. There have been a number of small, underpowered, not particularly well-performed studies in CRS using omeluzumab. And some of them have um, suggested improvement, but they've been small studies, as I said. Um, the study out of Belgium looked at nasal polyposis and comorbid asthma and found a significant improvement in polyp score, uh, polyp score and in asthma score and in nasal symptom score. Another study here was not particularly favourable, but it was a very underpowered study. So there's enough there to suggest that in a subgroup this is useful and there's ongoing studies with omeluzumab. What about anti-IL-5 drugs? Well, we have a number of them available now for asthma, and IL-5 obviously is an obvious target when you're talking about eosinophilic inflammation. It's a prominent feature of most atopic disease. So we know that CRS with nasal polyposis is largely characterised by eosinophilic inflammation and high IL-5 levels in the nasal tissue. The trouble is a lot of these people are refractory to the forms of therapy we've got at the moment. So this is a logical approach. And we have three molecules, mepoluzumab's the first, resliuzumab, which we don't have here, it's an IV preparation and has been associated with some problems, and benraluzumab, which has been more recently available. The difference between mepo and benra is that MEPO blocks IL-5, whereas BENRA blocks the IL-5 receptor and certainly gives um, massive clearance of eosinophils down to zero. 
So there's been some studies with MEPO, mainly the Belgian group, and they've taken, again, fairly small numbers, and they've looked for a primary endpoint of reduction in nasal polyp score after a couple of months. And indeed, they were able to demonstrate that it was effective at reducing nasal polyps. The MEPO group there with the placebo group on, on the far left. The trouble was um, this study had a lot of dropouts and a lot of problems and it's a small study. When the drug stopped, there was no rebound eosinophilia, which is something people worried about. And the other thing that this study showed that's been reproduced in the asthma studies is that these, these drugs are very safe. There's no significant adverse events. The, the sort of bugbear that people thought of, at least theoretically, was that you'd see parasitic in, infection, but in Western societies, at least, we haven't seen any signal for that at all. So the problem with these small studies was that there has been a reduction in nasal polyp size and a decrease in eosinophil count, but some of the studies have not reported symptomatic improvement. However, they have been short follow-up and small studies, and we're now waiting for the results to be published of phase three clinical trials with anti-IL-5 um, monoclonals. Same with Benra, it's uh, a little behind because it's newer, but again, we'll await the studies. So in summary, biologicals are going to be um, a big advance for a number of our patients who have been poorly controlled despite the best of medical and surgical management. While we still use oral steroids commonly for short bursts, as we've heard described earlier today, we mustn't kid ourselves that that is without side effects. I think the data is mounting that even short exposure to steroids uh, is detrimental to our patients. So we really do have to push for better therapies. As we understand phenotypic differences within the whole family of CRS, we can better define newer treatments. And it really does open up the possibility for targeted biological therapies as we under understand these pathomechanisms. One thing you can say almost universally about the group that I've discussed is the safety profile is excellent. We do need useful biomarkers to predict response because these are all expensive treatments. And we are starting to see published some algorithms of who may be suitable for biological treatments, how will we set up criteria, um, how are we going to show T2 inflammation, and also who are we going to define um, for continuation of therapy? Who are we going to stop because they haven't shown the type of improvement we would expect with an expensive therapy? So I think watch this space. We're going to see a lot more of these things develop. I think our job as surgeons and physicians, though, is to exert pressure on the PBAC to get reimbursement. First of all, exert pressure on the companies to register this drug for CRS. And once we have registration, we need a concerted effort to get reimbursement because these patients are just as deserving as patients with severe asthma and atopic dermatitis. And no one's going to be able to afford this. No hospital can um, afford it for patients. We need reimbursement. Thank you.